Shruti, over to you. Good evening, one and all. Welcome to Breaking the Barriers in Simulation Training Telesimulation Webinar. I am Shruti Bharadwaj, a proud volunteer at Project Step 1. I welcome all the wonderful speakers for today's session. Before we start, I would like to present a few slides. Project Step 1 is a volunteer-driven, non-profit collective of individuals from the startup community with volunteers and doctors from across India to provide free access to healthcare via telemedicine to the citizens affected by COVID-19 pandemic. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has made humanity face an unprecedented crisis, but our doctors and medical team have proved to be the heroes. Over the past 180 plus days, we have been successful in reaching 5 million citizens, 750k teleconsultations, and have prevented over 5 lakh contacts. Prajwal, can we have the video, please? We have around 7,000 plus doctors. We are the largest uh, uh, group of doctors who have the largest doctor volunteer force as of now. Doctors, your one hour from home daily can save thousands of lives. I request you all and appeal you to give a missed call on 080-471-92219 and join the largest doctor volunteer group. Thank you so much. Without taking much time, I hand it over to Dr. Geetanjali Ramchandran, Pediatric Intensivist, co-founder of uh, Pedistas India, Simulation Lead, Kim's Hospital, Sikandrabad. I welcome you, ma'am, and request you to introduce all our wonderful speakers for today. Doctor, over to you. Thank you, Shruti. And Project Step 1. Uh, for such amazing work. Uh, Shruti, uh, could you let me share my screen, please? Yes, doctor, you can share it. Thank you. Thank you. I welcome you all. Good evening and good morning, whichever space you're in, and happy Friday. Today is a very special day, not just for pedistas, but for whole India because first time in India, we have so many pioneers in simulation who have come to train us all. COVID has created a huge blockade in the simulation training. And three months ago, when we presented this seminar, uh, webinar, it was our dream. Uh, we visioned that we'll have a mantra to overcome the COVID blockade, that is three Cs collaboration, creating innovation, and community building. I'm extremely pleased to share that, that our vision and dream is coming true now, all because of the support from the wonderful international team, IPSs, Inspire, and each one of you uh, who have taken your time from the busy schedule to come and train us since last many years, and now you have crossed the bridge to come to India despite the blockade. Thank you very much. We also have our um, pillars of Pedistas, our executive committee here, who are holding the fort and who are always been the Pedistas with any time we call, with just few minutes of notice they're there supporting us. I welcome all the team and all the international faculty and all of the Pedistas member, members countrywide and all, also there are some people outside India who are watching this program, welcome to you. Welcome you all. I would like to uh, introduce our esteemed uh, speakers, um, Dr. Phoebe, um, Dr. Phoebe Ager. Uh, she is a physician from Mass General Hospital, Boston, and also has pioneered in uh, simulation. She's done a lot of simulation work. Dr. Phoebe, if you could let us know the work you've been doing with the simulation and telesimulation at your center, please. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's a thrill to be here with you. Um, as Gita mentioned, I'm a, I'm a pediatric intensivist at Mass General Hospital in Boston, and I oversee all of the simulation-based training activities for our children's hospital, and that includes telesimulation work, which has really heated up since the COVID pandemic hit Boston uh, this past spring. But even prior to COVID-19, I oversaw a telesimulation program with uh, one of our remote referral centers um, uh, to provide them with monthly oppor opportunities for team-based in-situ simulation without my having to physically travel to their facility um, to increase the frequency with which I could do training with them. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, I oversee our in-situ uh, PICU-based team training exercises um, across different environments in our own hospital. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Phoebe. If we come to Boston tomorrow, what would be the one place you would like her to see there? Oh my gosh, I, I couldn't say just one and that would be a dream come true, but I suppose after, of course, the Taj Mahal, um, I think it would be um, uh, just so wonderful to see so many of your beautiful temples and uh, go to see Mecca. The, the list would be very long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I can see. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for coming to India virtually. Uh, Dr. Mark Aubach, he is an associate professor in uh, emergency pediatrics, Yale University, and also director of the simulation. He's been uh, with Pedistars behind the screen for a long time. He's a uh, co-founder of Inspire and also advisor. Uh, Dr. Mark, if you could tell us your simulation work and a bit about daily simulation, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you so much. It's a real honor to join the group. And I, I love the vision of having um, your uh, project step one uh, for clinical work. And wonder if, uh, you know, perhaps uh, using those same uh, clinical specialists to support telesimulation. Um, my work has largely focused on uh, the efforts that children in the United States uh, are often cared for in community hospitals that may not have access to specialized intensivists or emergency physicians or by pre-hospital providers that might not have that access. So they might be far away from me. So uh, for a bit, we've been both traveling out to uh, work with them in our rural communities, as well as uh, embark on some work using telesimulation. So we've done that in a variety of methods, some uh, being remote access, where we did that with some hospitals in the mountains in North Carolina, uh, where we were uh, shipping them simulators and uh, through some federally funded grants, uh, we're able to to conduct a year's worth of simulations where we never met them in person, but we interacted with them uh, every uh, month over uh, the um, uh, telesimulation platform. And then recently needing to implement telesimulation for all of our learners, for medical students, residents, and others, where we don't have the opportunity to have in-person interactions uh, due to the pandemic and the regulations here in New Haven. So largely our work has focused on adapting our existing simulation curriculum to fit the uh, telesimulation platform. And I feel like each week I'm learning something new from this group and others about how to optimize the learning experience as well as the feedback that we get from our learners. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Dr. Albach, uh, for joining us. Uh, I can see on the screen Dr. Akira. Uh, Dr. Akira is a good friend of us and also a well wisher of Pedistars. He's a physician at Children's Hospital Philadelphia and also a co director of simulation program. Uh, Dr. Akira, if you could tell us about your simulation work, please. Great. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, first time in India virtually, and I'm hoping that I can uh, be with you guys uh, in, in the near future physically. The, um, the work um, uh, we have using the simulation for a variety of the projects and, and impacting on the clinical care and, and the uh, outcome of our children. The, um, during the COVID, we, we did a lot of training simulation, but also we used the simulation to 
uh, train our systems to prevent, to uh, safely care of the children who may or may not have COVID. And also that, that, uh, that we prepare our systems for the next sort of second peak or outbreak, so to speak. So we train the systems using the simulation. Uh, separate from that, I have worked with uh, two medical schools in Japan, and I'm in Philadelphia, so it takes time to travel, but I don't have to travel, so we do remote simulation regularly with two medical schools in Japan, and that has been uh, working quite well. So you'll see some video clips after that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Akira. Uh, Dr. Isabel Gross, uh, she's a great friend of ours and also has helped many stars. Uh, Dr. Isabel works with Dr. Mark Hobbach at uh, ER in the Yale uh, University. She's also uh, both belongs to IPSS and INSPIRE board of the directors. So Isabel, if you could tell a little about your telesimulation work. Thank you so much, Gita, for this. Very, very kind introduction. I'm so excited to be here. And if I was to visit India, I would, I would just text you, ask you where you are, and this is exactly where I would want to be. Um, yeah, so very excited to be in this very enthusiastic group. Um, I'm passionate about uh, telesimulation because I live in a country where I wasn't born and I was very, very enthusiastic about really spreading simulation to other institutions, not just for the learners, but also to train the facilitators, to train um, who I consider myself to be. Um, so I've done a lot of work with um, a colleague in Latvia, really playing around, trying to figure out what the best way is to use telesimulation for the past four years. And um, I have also done a project with um, Italy. Then COVID hit and everything changed. <laughs> it's just wonderful to see how, how everybody's now um, doing a lot of different ways of telesimulation. I'm learning something new every single day. I'm per personally particularly interested in understanding the concept of telesimulation and we'll tell you later a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Dr. Aaron Callahan, he's from uh, Louisville and also uh, Norton Children's Hospital. He's a professor of pediatrics. Again, a well-wisher of uh, Pedistars. He's a uh, board of uh, director of SSH and also co-chair of INSPAR. It's an honor to have you all. Aaron, if you could tell a bit about your telesimulation work, please. Oh, well, thank you, Geetha. And it's, it's a true pleasure to be here. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity. It's really an honor to be on this panel. You know, I, I have to say that the, the two uh, aspects I would highlight is I come, I come to the telesimulation world from more of the inspire slash research aspect of it. I'm very interested in the questions of definition of nomenclature of um, how best to develop our knowledge base to better determine when we should be delivering telesimulation, what specific modality within telesimulation, what are the um, what are learning objectives that are best suited to it? What are learning objectives that aren't? And so I think that there's a real open field for uh, inquiry and research here that's frankly something we can all get on on the ground floor. This is long and coming. Um, from an uh, implementation standpoint, I'm actually quite a novice in telesimulation. We had to, um, to use the buzzword these days, pivot rather quickly whenever COVID hit. And it's not something our program had engaged in. So we had to quickly develop rapidly a virtual simulation infrastructure. We had to figure out how to do it at very low costs with uh, essentially no budget and just to make sure that our education needs are being met. And so I'm hoping some of uh, our experience and having to convert quickly and to convert uh, on the fly and with a low budget, so to speak, can really speak to the situations where you, that you all are dealing with and offer you some concrete suggestions and practical solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, Elizabeth Sansom, she's again a great friend of ours. She's a physician at uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia Emergency. And uh, she's done a lot of work, uh, not just at Chaw, but also Alaska in uh, telesimulation. Isabel, uh, if you could let us know about your work. Uh, sorry, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, well, hi, everyone. Geetha, thank you very much for inviting me. I have met Geetha over the years at the IPSS International Simulation Conference, and we always end up in the same group and the same cohorts, listening to the same conferences. And so I've always wanted to visit you in India, and today is finally the day. So thank you for inviting me. I am by far the most novice person on this panel today. So for that, I apologize, and I thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> 
like Isabel, if I were to come to India, I would be exactly next to you, Geetha, also doing what doing whatever you're doing, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> so we'll have to make that happen whenever we're allowed to. Um, we, my, we are a team across India. <laughs> we are. We're building community. Um, my interest in simulation really lies in providing education for learners where there is no education already for learners. So prior to coming to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I was working as a as a bush doctor, as a pediatrician in remote Alaska. And my colleagues were community health aid practitioners who um, basically had a 12th grade education and were responsible for 24 seven care in the remote Alaska native villages. And they over time asked me for simulation based training. And as a doer and an action learner, um, we decided that that made a lot of sense. So we developed um, a curriculum in remote Alaska which over time uh, we decided could be really cool to do it tele via tele and COVID has really pushed us into learning how to provide remote distance simulation. Um, here at CHOP, I have collaborated with Mark Auerbach and Vina and all of you, Geetha, Ebor, and PD Stars uh, to develop out some tele simulation um, education platforms. And I'm really excited to discuss lessons learned and our experiences and learn from you all today. So thank you again for inviting me. Must have guessed who it is, Dr. Vinay Narkarni. He's been with us for years, uh, even when we started to walk, take baby steps, and he stayed with us when we were walking, and he's you know, pushing us to run. Uh, Vinay, uh, he's from CHOP. Uh, again, as I said, he doesn't need introduction. If you can tell uh, one line about your telesimulation work. Sure, it's a great pleasure to be here. I think we're all still taking baby steps, particularly when it comes to distance simulation. And it's an honor to be part of the panel today. Um, today, I think what uh, my interest is really in uh, dissemination and penetration of simulation from education to practice to outcome. And today um, we've been running a, a boot camp for our first year uh, fellow trainees for many years, 15 years. And this year we really had to switch to more of a distance format. So the challenges and also the benefits of doing that challenge is what I'm pleased to discuss today. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, Vinay keeps coming to India virtually or in person <laughs> again and again. Mm -hmm. So we feel he's part of the Petty Stars family, which he is. Uh, now what we will do is we'll ask our uh, executive committee members of Petty Stars um, to raise uh, their questions. So they're representing all the Petty Stars members across India. Uh, so they are their voices. So uh, let us start with Dr. Arun Bansal. He's a professor in PGI Chandigarh and also our North Zone coordinators. Arun, what is your question to the panel? Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. And thanks, Geeta, for having me here and with this such an elite panel. Uh, in India, simulation is quite new. And now this comes the tele-simulation, which is another uh, relatively new thing. Means uh, I don't think many of us know what is tele-simulation and how is it going to work? Because everybody thinks that simulation should be a uh, hands-on experience. So maybe we can learn something about that. What is tele-simulation? to any of the panelists or maybe Isabel, Isabel, if you can tell us something about that. Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked because I did prepare some slides for that question. <laughs> Gita, you can advance the slides for me. Thank you. Um, yeah, very excited to talk about it. Um, there are many different um, words you can use for the concept of um, distance simulation or telesimulation. But I just wanted to share a concept that we have developed during our Healthcare Distance Simulation Summit. These slides are a compliment by um, Todd Chang. So thank you so much, Todd, for letting us use the slides. So here you can see a mannequin, an operator, a facilitator, and a learner. This is just to get everybody on the same page of what we're talking about. On the next slide, you can see a traditional simulation. So you see that box and the facilitator, operator, learner, and mannequin are all in one place. 
but maybe the facilitator could actually be at home, as you can see, with a little house next to it, and um, just the operator, learner, and mannequin are in the same place. Or the learner could be at home, facilitator, operator, with the mannequin. Or you could even have a component of time where you separate the simulation happening and the learners accessing the simulation by time. Today, you will hear about many different ways of doing this because COVID really pushed us um, to, to think outside the box and to really try out pretty much all the modes that I just showed you, just as an example. So people could be separated by geography, by time, or by both geography and time. So your facilitator, operator, and learner could be separated, or everybody could be in a different place. During our summit, we came up with the three most used terms. As Aaron was saying, we're both pretty passionate about, and many team members are, um, are about uh, really finding the, the appropriate nomenclature about what are we talking about behind this. So um, telesimulation, remote simulation, and distance simulation were the top runners for the concept we are talking about. Um, there is no conclusion. Um, you can use any of those words for now. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Thank Ita. you very much for that introduction. Um, I would like Thank to you. request, uh, thank you, Arun, um, Dr. Rakshay Shetty, uh, he's a uh, co-founder and also president of Medistars. Just to uh, let you all or let us know what kind of blockade COVID has caused and what all the works we were doing before, uh, Rakshay. So thank you, Gitanjali, and um, uh, thank you for all the international experts uh, for coming and joining together for a wonderful meeting on Telesim. And uh, uh, Gitanjali, as you might know, uh, one of the things uh, from Pedisa's point of view is that we went we were into simulation mainly because uh, as a clinicians we were figuring out what's the best way to improve care we provide to sick children. And one of the aims of our society was integrating simulation into healthcare systems so with the objective of improving patient outcomes. And with that objective in mind, uh, over the last eight years or so, uh, we, were, uh, we designed a lot of workshops with a couple of ideas. One is to sensitize people about how powerful a tool like simulation can be to train and to improve patient care outcomes. And also about creating a pool of new trainers, because that is something uh, we struggle is to get new trainers to train. And with that intent, uh, we've ran workshops focusing uh, like a boot camps on emergency pediatrics, on ICU, focusing on people, gender pediatricians, focusing on fellows, focusing on practicing intensivist, neonatologists, with various names like STEP, Neosim, TIPS workshop, success workshop, boot camps. And uh, like what you can see on the map, I mean, uh, we, we kind of conducted over years at different parts of the country. And uh, the other uh, thing was uh, our faculty development program. And over years, we realized that uh, uh, a couple of day workshop is generally not sufficient. So we kind of started a year mentorship program where they go through staged training, where they run simulation at their places and we give debriefing uh, and help them to debrief better. And uh, <clears throat> what we realized this year uh, with all the pandemic hitting and also uh, is that none of these workshops are physically possible to do. And just to uh, put the case in map, you can see this COVID-19 simulathon we ran. Uh, again, there was a lot of challenges in terms of um, uh, record development program where we want our participants to run simulation and we can debrief. And this is where we thought probably telesimulation in today's context, would be something will be very, very beneficial. So that is something for us. Uh, COVID has come. It has uh, changed the world in an unprecedented way. We need to look at innovative solutions. As someone who propagates simulation, to improve patient care, to improve the training we provide. So it, it is a challenge to find out how do we do that better? How do we, that, we do that differently? And uh, this is somewhere I think it would be immensely beneficial for pedestrians and also for all these uh, 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 physicians who are looking out to improve their patient care outcomes, how we can train in a different way. And I think this is where this uh, platform of telesimulation is going to hold a lot of uh, promise, especially in the times to come. Thank you, Gitanjali. Thank you so much, Rakshai. 
Uh, may I give the virtual mic to Dr. Supraja Chandrasekhar? She's been a pillar of Pedistas and also our member of the executive committee. Supraja, if you can uh, your, ask your queries to our panel, please. Sure. Um we've been used to doing in-situ simulation. It took us a while to learn it and um, do it especially for the new learners with low cost mannequin, which suits our country. Um, I would like to ask Phoebe, um, how does this work with telesimulation? So everybody I think has alluded to this pivot that we have all been forced to make. Um, I think that when, when COVID hit, Boston, we, um, we were really challenged with how best to continue to provide meaningful educational opportunities for our own trainees when everyone was quarantining at home unless they were knee deep in the hospital taking care of um, sick patients. And we experimented with a number of different low tech telesimulation strategies. But um, I think as is often the case, what we found to be most successful ended up being the simplest. Um, and what I've displayed here is an example of what it looks like. We have um, uh, several trainees who are each actually at home um, and we use a Zoom platform. And um, you can see that one window displays a picture of the simulated patient and their vital signs typed on the screen and the other windows display each member of the responding team. And I, as a facilitator, may be at the hospital or may be home myself, actually, and I can control the patient screen. I can type in new vitals as the participants um, uh, you know, make their interventions. Um, and then I can also display imaging, EKG, if that's what the responding team has asked for. Um, I can be the patient's voice, or in this case, maybe the patient's uh, parent. Um, and, um, and in this way, with careful selection of cases that don't require a lot of intervention and hands-on, um, I've uh, found that the participants have been very engaged um, with, without a lot of fancy bells and whistles that I think many of us were all used to before we had to make this pivot. Thanks a lot. That that was helpful. May I also ask, um, do we, do you use mannequins, low cost mannequins for this? So, um, you know, we, we don't, um, we, uh, have started to bring some trainees back, uh, back in together in very small pairs, limiting up to three or four, where they can be in one location and I as a facilitator can be in another. And we do um, tend to, we have our, um, um, uh, our you know, high fidelity mannequins and I can manipulate the monitor at the remote uh, uh, site using an application like Team Viewer. Um, but I, um, I have to say that we are doing increasingly more activity um, just in the way that I've uh, demonstrated now until people feel that it's safer for people to be together. Thank you so much. Um, probably uh, Liz, if you can add on to it, if you can share your experience, please. Absolutely. Um, oh, thank you. So <laughs> like I mentioned in my introduction, my work prior to coming to Philadelphia was in remote Alaska where I worked on the left, you see a map of the geographic region of where I was living that is technically called the bush because you cannot drive there, you have to fly there. And this is Southwest Alaska. I was located in Bethel, Alaska, which is the orange dot there in the middle. And I like this map because in green, you see the air miles from Bethel to all of these remote Alaska native villages. And in orange, it might be too small, you might not be able to see it, but in orange, you see the flight times from Bethel. So as a pediatrician sitting in Bethel, I, my job was 100% pretty much tele, telemedicine with community health practitioners working out in places like Kotlik and Imanik, um, who, um, and here is a picture of some of the community health aides 
who would call me when they had a pediatric patient that they were worried about and we would manage the patient remotely. Um, so what we did when the community health aides asked for a simulation based training was we actually developed an in situ simulation program that was very low resource using only the dolls and the medical equipment that they have in their facility. And to attempt to make this a sustainable program we trained the local um, educators in the facility to become simulation trainers by flying up some simulation facilitators from Seattle Children's Hospital for a two day training session. And here's a picture of the educators there in the training session looking like they're having a great time. Um, and we studied their experiences and focus groups and the, the facilitators felt that they did learn the simula a simulation structure. They felt like they could, could have the confidence to go ahead and start running their simulations. They were pleasantly and surprised by how the community health practitioners actually responded to uh, the simulations that they were starting to give and that they felt that the scenarios were, they were improving their scenarios with practice. So. I actually learned how to do this from you all from the PD stars presentations that I went to at IPSS. So I thank you all for helping me do this in Alaska. Um, and what we did not do in Alaska, which is what you're doing with PD stars is we didn't have the ongoing mentorship to facilitate those and empower those facilitators to continue um, si uh, facilitating simulations moving forward. So unfortunately that program in Alaska no longer exists. However, like I mentioned before, there's a robust telemedicine structure that the entire state of Alaska actually relies upon to deliver care to the most remote indigenous communities. So what we have, what I spent a lot of time thinking about is how do you use the telemedicine network to engage your learners via telesimulation? So I think what I'll do is I'll let Mark talk about the next step, the next step. Right. Thank you so much, Liz and Dr. Phoebe. Um, you learned a lot. Um, could I request uh, Dr. Mohit Sarni? He's our uh, West Zone coordinator for Peri Stars uh, to ask your questions, please. Hi, good evening and good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like to ask Aaron, like, as you know, in during these times, you know, we have like, what we have done is in our hospitals, we have divided our duties and days. So if, because if someone comes positive, they contain each and everyone in contact. So I'm sitting at my home and I don't have access to the mannequin. Okay, so if I want to do like, we do regular teachings for our students and fellows and I don't have mannequin like, and mannequin, like it is there in our head that a mannequin is a important part for the simulations uh, teaching. So in telesim, if you don't have the mannequin, how we can do that? If you can just share your experiences. I'm just gonna just pull my screen up here. So thanks, that's actually, a, that's an excellent question. I think it's really key to what we're doing here. I've got a couple slides. I know they're kind of busy. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip through. I was kind of telling a bit of our story, but the reality is, is that I have found over time that the mannequin is a useful adjunct, it's a tool. It's a tool to help us tell a clinical story that engages participants, that accesses certain aspects of their, of their cognition, aspects of their um, ways of thinking about things. But it is perfectly possible, in many cases, um, even more viable than mannequin-based sim, depending on your learning objectives, to um, get to that same thought process, get to that same um, that level of cognitive openness to new ways of doing things without a mannequin. So a quick example is, is what we had to do at our hospital. You know, we're in the middle of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. We were not hit uh, quite as hard up front with COVID, but we quickly shut down everything, which is, I think, part of the reason why we were not hit quite as hard up front. But we had no option to use mannequin-based um, distance simulation at all. Um, we have a number of mannequins, but our AV system was in the process of being upgraded, and the upgrade stopped. So we had no way of accessing it, and I had to quickly find a way to reinitiate a simulation with with basically nothing physical to work off of and trying to work with uh, existing online platforms. And our solution, I went online basically and tried to find the quickest way to display vital signs that would let me use my previously programmed simulations. Um, this is not meant to be a um, commercial uh, advocation here. We tend to use layered all systems at our place. And so I went to them first to see if they had a cheap way to uh, display vital signs and they did. It's a stripped down version of their normal platform that's free to download. And so that meant I could use my entire sim library and wouldn't have to rewrite everything. So that was a plus. It was, it was very, um, very efficient. And then Blackboard Collaborate is just one of the many um, virtual uh, communication and education tools. You could use Zoom, you could use anything you wanted. But the way we approached it and the way I would suggest that you think about that is, um, I'm gonna skip ahead here, but um, 
consider <clears throat> consider your learning objectives and consider ways that you can encounter you can uh, deal with those learning objectives in a way that does involve physical presence. Our typical simulations. This is a, a, a um, screenshot from one of our virtual sims using the vital sign software I mentioned. Um, this is a, a case of uh, status asthmaticus. And normally I would worry about both getting the cognitive aspects and the hands-on skills about uh, trying to get a good robust crisis resource management team on board with nurses and physicians. And so we deconstructed. Uh, I talked to our nursing director and said, do you think that we can actually do an um, a, uh, interdisciplinary sim here um, in a virtual environment or will one group outweigh the other in terms of talking? Would it be better if we split for the time being nursing education and physician education to focus on just the cognitive needs necessary in this environment to simplify matters? And we decided to try that. So we, I just work with the residents um, at this point with our nursing educator working with the nurses. And what I decided is that since we can't do physical hands-on education in this environment, we would flip it entirely. We wouldn't worry about the physical aspects. We would focus entirely on physiology, on uh, key discussion points, in terms of what's going on in various aspects of asthma. This is a crudely drawn, uh, hand-drawn version of a venous return curve under different situations of um, intrathoracic pressure. And so what we did is we adopted a stop and go debriefing format. We treat it like a problem-based learning session. We uh, try to generate a collaborative environment where all the residents, all the participants were actively discussing what was happening. I would go through the case like I was a storyteller and we were just kind of sitting around a table and I was telling them the story and asking what they would do and, and try to make it as interactive that way as possible. But then I would pause. We wouldn't do a traditional after sim debriefing. We would stop at key moments and we would do question and answer based debriefing, still using an advocacy inquiry format where I'm trying to get them to do the thinking based on key physiologic changes. And then we would uh, go through it. I would illustrate those changes. I would pull up um, YouTube videos if need be. I found an excellent one for this sim uh, free of uh, somebody reinflating a collapsed lung from the inside. I have no idea where it came from, but it really illustrated what happens when a tension pneumothorax resolves. And so we took this as an opportunity to add in a lot of extra AV uh, feedback to a micro debriefing format and really focus on the cognitive aspects of the sim since it's what we could do best in that environment. I guess what we learned is, A, it's possible to do. It's possible to make a difference. It's possible for this to be well-received and to be done virtually for free. Um, you might need to change your educational emphasis and learning objectives, and that's where a lot of flexibility comes in. I, I don't yet know how you can train somebody on the skills, the physical skills to intubate, say, from a distance environment. There may be some creative solution in the future um, as technology evolves. But again, we were going for what we could do with what we had. And so we changed to thought process. We also found, interestingly enough, and this is still evolving at our hospital, we're now able to go back to 10 or, 10 or less uh, people in a room for simulation training since our numbers are not that high. And so we've been doing live simulation since about mid-July. The nurses did not want to go back. They were getting so much from the cognitive nursing-oriented sessions that we elected to do residents live and go back to teaching physical skills and allow the nurses to finish their simulation year, at least in the ICU, doing uh, online distance simulation with the thought to um, give a, more thought in the January timeframe as to how to do a limited reintegration. So we're doing both virtual for more cognitive aspects of things and in person for physical skills based and for teamwork or crisis resource management where you really need to have people in a room interacting around a real situation. We're still negotiating how to best accomplish that. But the lesson I learned here is that in, many, in some cases, the virtual environment, the telesim environment, may not actually be a limitation. It may actually enhance things. Um, I'll just close by saying that an idea that I grew up in simulation with during my 13 years doing this was that fidelity is good. Higher fidelity is better. That's being challenged. Um, I think that higher fidelity is better, and I'm going to be very vague here and say for the things that high fidelity simulation is good for. Um, perhaps different kinds of fidelity are better for things um, that you need to teach in other ways. It may be better to teach physiology with access to all of the diagrams and tools you can do virtually than it is in a room where all those things are fit on a small screen. So I throw that out there as a way to say that this is actually pushing us into new territory. I think there'll be new theories that are actually going to come out there about how this works with learning They're gonna, that are going to show that in many cases, the cheapest way may in fact be the best way for education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request Mark to add on to this? Uh, with some... um, Aaron, if I can share the screen. Uh, 
Um, thank Mark, you. You're muted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So um, I, I really am excited to share some of our ideas and work. And I think, again, trying to think about uh, not only uh, serving our learners within the simulation center, but perhaps serving learners that cannot easily come to the simulation center or facilitators that uh, cannot easily travel out to the learner. So very similar to what Isabel and Todd uh, drafted, uh, we have um, taken a similar model of it, it's kind of where the learners, the facilitators and the technology lie. Um, so uh, we had initially developed something called Simbox, uh, which uh, was through a uh, collaboration across multiple groups. And through Simbox, uh, we had uh, conducted a, a model that uh, we've begun to collaborate with uh, Ibor and Jika and others in India on, where it involves um, uh, the initial uh, approach involves sending a very low cost inflatable mannequin to sites with a uh, virtual set of facilitators and a group of either in-person mixed with virtual or all virtual or all in-person participants. And really this leverages the lowest cost technology. It tries to leverage YouTube uh, videos. And I think the concept that is most important to get across here is this idea of sim on rails. So um, what that means is that the simulation and the vital signs are sort of on a single train track. So as opposed to the typical simulations where we can have the heart rate go up or down based on individuals interactions and responses we actually have the same set of vital signs on the youtube video but use our facilitators to nudge or help to guide the uh, case and provide some responses and feedback about what the child looks like or what the simulator is doing this allows really someone with no uh, simulation resources to conduct a simulation. Uh, it can have a higher fidelity mannequin like this. It can have a low cost inflatable mannequin, but it can also have a group of individuals that are uh, all interacting uh, virtually. Um, so some of the things that we've done, and I'll just uh, sort of bring up my virtual background now, is use things like virtual backgrounds um, and green screens and other aspects. So our standardized patient actor would be in a room uh, with another view, I might be in the room like this with a um, nurse uh, presentation, and we can have some interactions uh, that occur that help to increase that realism, as Aaron mentioned. But I really think our focus has been on flexibility. So if the learners um, can come to a single location, then we can uh, use the remote facilitation and the YouTube videos. If they cannot come to a remote, lo a, a centralized location, then we can do everything virtually or we can do a mix. And I, I do want to highlight a comment that Aaron made. I think a key lesson learned has been when people are doing this virtually limiting the number of people that are speaking or interacting. Um, if that number of individuals uh, is above two or three that are actively speaking, the Zoom can't really handle it. So it's one thing that, that's come up actually in our School of Music here at Yale that the way Zoom works is it cancels out other people's voices and, and that's a noise cancellation technology. So I can not speak over Gita or concurrent at the same time as Gita. Um, so because of that, we've leveraged the chat function and other methodologies, but really tried to set appropriate rules to optimize the experience. Um, and, and I want to highlight that whatever technique you are using to engage your learners, really the debriefing is the uh, place where we find that much of the uh, learning occurs. So whether that's reflecting in action, as Aaron mentioned, with the pause button debrief or rapid cycle deliberate practice practice or reflecting on action, completing the simulation, having a discussion, we've found that from our feedback from students, residents, and nurses, even with limiting the group size, that they find that the virtual simulation is of very high uh, quality and is very valuable to them uh, because of the debriefing. And that in those debriefings, uh, everyone has a chance to interact and learn together. But uh, we've been really surprised and frankly are questioning what we'll do in the future, I think, as Aaron alluded to uh, because we've spent a lot of money creating simulation centers millions of dollars and we have technicians and other individuals and as phoebe demonstrated in her work using these lower cost things like powerpoint slides and youtube videos 
as long as they set up the learners for the magic of a, a expert facilitated debriefing, we've found that this experience is of similar value. You probably lose a little bit, as Aaron mentioned. I think there are certain objectives that we've needed to take out from some of our simulations, but there's actually been some really great creative ways of moving around those using uh, videos, using opportunities to actually send equipment to people or have people go and pick up equipment that's lower cost or lower technology. So really exciting journey. I would describe this as a disruptive innovation, meaning that we had a problem, we are addressing that problem, and I think we're going to end up solving a lot of problems beyond what we're addressing with this. So just really excited to work together. Um, and Ibor and uh, Gita and, and Elizabeth, uh, we'll, we'll see what we learn over the next few months trying to take uh, some of the work that we've done and apply it in India. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's been amazing, the Simbox, it's a kind of lifeline. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, Arun Bansal, he's got a burning question. Arun, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Geeta, for bringing me in again. Um, I'd like to move a bit away from the low-cost mannequin to the high-fidelity mannequins, because that's what we have. We have both the low-cost and the high-fidelity also at our center. So how do we uh, use that mannequin in our training or in our uh, scenario during this pandemic and uh, in which conditions we can use that? If uh, means is uh, first Akira maybe that is able if they can share their experience. Absolutely. So my experience uh, came actually before the COVID, um, the, do you see the PowerPoint? Yes, my experience you came- just have to before. double click it again. Yeah. Um, that um, when I realized that I cannot travel um, the often back to Japan when I'm trying to teach medical students there. Uh, so that's where the uh, necessity came from. It is actually uh, not uncommon that uh, uh, some of the institutions did purchase uh, high fidelity or high functioning mannequins. So you have simulators. Uh, it is uh, common that your local teams using uh, the high, those high cost mannequins. So you have a people locally and you may have a curriculum already developed. So the, the question here is during the pandemic or any situation you cannot do uh, uh, physical simulation of facilitators and learners cannot be in the same loop. How you can leverage those uh, previously built resources to uh, continue, the educate, continue effective education. So this is what I was faced with uh, back in 2013. I have to do this monthly. So we create a complex system. You don't have to pay much detention, detail, uh, uh, much attention to the details. Basically, we create a dual system. So one system controls the uh, local simulator at the learning site. The other computer, the other system communicates the uh, facilitators and learners with the camera, so video system. Back then, that was difficult. Nowadays, with Zoom and Bluezins and other platform, it's not difficult. Uh, I like to play a video clip how we did. This is a view we, we see from uh, Philadelphia. The learners are in Japan. And you see the medical student gathering around the mannequin. Uh, this is the first scenario. They don't have a team structure. The patient desaturating and try to figure out what to do. Then we debrief. So this is a screen, and actually you see the learners standing in line, and we are communicating. And I'm, I'm talking in their language, uh, communicating about the bag mass ventilation and effectiveness. This is a second simulation. So the leaders asking for help. And the leaders trying to put the monitor on the mannequin. 
and then the team member advised the reader not to do by himself. Then this is the last clip. The patient is going to uh, um, cardiac arrest and the team responds relatively quickly. Everybody is staring at the monitor and then the leader instructs the team member to initiate uh, CPR. This is how the room looked like from my office to facilitate. So two screens and a video communicating system and laptop to operate the uh, simulator. And we demonstrated uh, on-site or remote simulation both improved the uh, learner's performance. So the, um, in during the COVID, you may not be able to have the learners all in place, but you can do hybrid. Some of the learners can be remotely uh, participating and some of the learners can be in the room or you can do the only one facilitator at the mannequin and you have the other learners tell facilitators what to do based on the, uh, the patient progression. There are multiple ways of to conduct remote simulation. The last one minute I'd like to mention that the use of tele-simulation uh, for actually the, uh, shaping up the care of the patient that uh, we use the telesimulation to come up with the common language to improve the patient care. This was supported by Inspire Network and the IPSSW. Uh, we actually did a remote simulation between Philadelphia and uh, this time in the UK. And we played a real time video, then we asked the expert what to say, how to coach the particular procedure. So this is a, uh, what's happening in Philadelphia. And um, this uh, person doing the procedure is quite nervous and there are a lot of uh, advice being given. However, not very effective. This was, um, uh, this seat was given to all the participants in the, in the grass row and how do you coach? Then we discussed and we came up with those should be a standard language. So during the COVID, you may want to have the expert consensus opinion on how to take care of the challenging situations and how to maximize the process of care of the patient. You can use the telesimulation for that. So the, I, my last message is that challenges become opportunities that the telesimulation expands the capa uh, capability of current simulation uh, in the high fidelity, high tech simulators and also expand the pool of facilitators, the educators, and also generating the protocol of standardized language procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Akira. This sounds very interesting. It uh, means very fascinating to see if we can do it as a, from far off distance. And maybe we need to steal you once a month for uh, our institute also. Uh, we'll see how it can go. Um, and maybe you can help us in that. Uh, Isabel, can you add something on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Akira. This was great to see how, how you are doing it. I always find it fascinating to actually um, be able to, to see what the learning environment and the work environment looks like in different countries. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, I've been talking to Akira about this a lot because we have been sharing this passion for a few years now. Um, what has been said before, I will echo, many times high-tech equipment is not the problem. So for example, in my case, the, the way that um, I was um, you know, developing my telesimulation experience was that Reines from Latvia contacted me and said, listen, we have, this, we have this beautiful, shiny simulation center. We have everything you could ask for, but not many of us actually know how to facilitate. Can you help me? And uh, I said, no, I can't help you, but we can do this together as peers. So we together developed um, a way of facilitating together. So in this picture, you can see how um, this little desk with the person on the left side that is 
um, me in Yale. And what I can see is a computer screen with what everybody now is very familiar with. <laughs> so vital signs and a video. On the other side, you can see what Reynes was seeing, which is they projected me on a gigantic screen, which intimidated both me and, and the participants. And also Reynes and everybody, had a, there was a 360 camera so that everybody could see. And this way over time, over the time of actually years, um, we worked together and get, got to know the students and were able to use all that fancy equipment. I got a chance to visit Latvia. It, it was amazing. Their simulation center has a, a definitely more equipment than ours, um, but it wasn't used. It was just in the closets. And this way, Reynes and I were able to really get this out of the closets. Here you can see the view. We used many different platforms because at the time we tried this out, Zoom wasn't as established yet. So this one is, I don't know, Learning Space Intuity. We tried at least five different platforms, including Google and Skype and everything, <laughs> just to see what works best. It all comes down to really sound quality and internet uh, connection. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so Reynes and I actually thought, let's take this further. And here you can see a simulation during the COVID pandemic with Northern Italy, Udine, that is near Lombardy. This is near the, the, the epicenter where Epic in Europe was really, um, uh, you know, extreme. And you can see how our learners now have um, masks on and they were allowed to be in a room, but we were remote because we were supposed to be doing a, a telesimulation again with training facilitators, but the facilitators weren't allowed to travel within Italy anymore. So we just did pure telesimulation with um, co-facilitating with somebody that was also remote. <laughs> so we had facilitator, facilitator, facilitator. Um, and we were controlling the mannequin um, remotely teaching a local operator. So um, yeah, so my passion, as I said, train the trainer, use that equipment, get that equipment out of the closets and, um, and work with it. Always happy to collaborate with others if interested. And yeah, that's all I have to say about high-tech simulation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Isabel. That was really great. And I think it's the need of the R now, telesimulation. That's what it will, it sounds very fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, may I request uh, Vijay? Vijay is uh, our Joint Secretary of Peristas um, to ask your question, please. Yeah, my question to Vinay Nadkarni. Uh, first of all, thank you, Gitanjali, and I want to thank Vinay uh, being so supportive and the great mentor since the inception of PD Stars, and you are making us to grow and grow and grow, and uh, so thank you very much for that. You are always there. So as Rakshay mentioned, Vinay, we conduct several workshops and boot camps, TOTs, you know that, you know everything. So, but with the COVID pandemic, we are all like, uh, can't do any of these. But you just told us that you have done a uh, across US a, a remote simulation or boot camp for your fellows. Could you help us or give some suggestions in how to go about to restart our um, workshops and boots, uh, boot camp from PD Stars? Over to Vinay. Thank you in advance. Well, thank you. Um, I think, uh, Yita, if you can pull up the slide and share, that would be great. Um, yeah. One of the things people have talked about, and we've evolved from sort of no mannequin to remote mannequin, and now some high-tech stuff in the last few discussions, but we have been running the, um, a, a boot camp across the country for about 15 years, and they've been very hands-on, very basic, a lot of people touching each other, and the camaraderie, we wondered whether we could preserve this and accomplish this. So we transitioned this year, the boot camp to a hybrid format, back one. And the, the, uh, the concept was on four successive weekends, we could take groups of trainees from different hospitals. We could have their local simulation experts run their task training, tracheal intubation, um, their central line insertion. Gita, can you just back up the slide once? Yeah. And thank you. And uh, they would uh, intersperse this 
with our Zoom meetings, which brought them together, not physically, but to discuss and to have panel discussions to get the flavor of what was being done across the country with different opinions from different attending physicians. Next slide. The preparation was different for faculty than it was for fellows. So we had a faculty handbook, which had various cues and the actual scenarios next. And then we had a fellow handbook, keep going, Gita. And that uh, had the actual uh, infographics for them to do. They trained on skill training before the boot camp. next. And then we interspersed, oh, back one, Gita, you're going too fast. There you go. In yellow, you see the short regional virtual panels, lectures that were interspersed with local hands-on simulation and debriefing. And then after their local simulation and debriefing, we would have a panel where they would share the lessons learned. Next slide. It still preserved some of the local context, but it also allowed us to have a safe environment where small groups were interacting. Next slide. One of the things that was very useful that we will preserve was the virtual wall, the questions and answers that could be shared asynchronously and will persist beyond the boot camp and continue to stay active for months beyond to bring that community of learners together. So we're still exploring and learning how we can preserve the camaraderie that is built, the connections that are built, and the hands-on training in a hybrid environment while still bringing people together virtually in a boot camp setting. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, there's a video we'll see at the end since we are running short of time a little. So we'll move on to the next uh, um, question from uh, Dr. Mihir. He's our East Zone Coordinator. Mihir? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kitanjali. So good evening and uh, good morning to to all of you. So I am uh, very new in the telesimulations and very audit about the technical issues, especially after hearing from Dr. Akira. And so uh, I want to know from uh, Dr. Elizabeth, uh, what are the challenges to face during the telesimulation and especially your tips to solve these uh, issues regarding the technical issues in telesimulations? Dr. Elizabeth. Yeah, absolutely. So the telesimulations that we were running were using that Telesim box, Sim on Rails, YouTube videos that Mark brought up the slide earlier and showed. And the technical challenges, uh, Mark alluded to some of them. So using Zoom, talking over one another was distracting. As Aaron put in the chat box, we probably should have been using blue jeans all along. So maybe that's a solution for that one. You can maybe talk over each other more with blue jeans, but we made that into a learning objective saying in real life, people are talking over each other in a resuscitation. So here in Zoom, we can practice not talking over each other also. Other technical challenges were um, certainly getting a history from the family members. So we had written into our learning objectives for medical student simulations to get a good thorough history from the family member and to update the family member throughout the scenario. And that was impossible in our telesimulation environment and it, it was distracting when that was happening. So solutions that um, we've thought of are either using the chat box or a breakout room or actually physically picking up the phone and muting yourself and making a phone call to a co-facilitator and then bringing the history back to the group. But of course, telesimulation relies on a, a reliable internet connection. And so when we think about delivering telesimulations to areas that don't have reliable internet connection. That's the challenge that I think we continue need to, we need to think about. So how do you develop a telesimulation? Easy to create, easy to use, um, easy to train the trainer telesimulation tool that when the internet goes down, the show must go on. And how do you make that happen? And so I think that's the challenge that um, I think about now, and if that's one thing I thought about is, can you download a video? Can you download that YouTube video? And if you've trained the trainer how to use it just by pressing start, stop, pause, rewind, restart, then the show can go on. But I'm really interested in opening up and seeing what your thoughts are on that. 
thank you if the time permits i can i uh, ask uh, dr mark uh, to uh, his experience on the challenges he faced and the tips regarding the technical issues yeah thank you so i i think that the experience on the challenges for the technical issues are many times more in our heads as simulationists so as long as we make the learners um understand that those technical issues can happen and put that in our pre-briefing i have found that dealing with the technical issues is probably more something we put on ourselves as faculty and sometimes we derail our simulations because of our own self uh sort of flagellation so to speak so i would just recommend that if you have technical issues that you should not be surprised that this is part of simulation that I don't think I've ever run a simulation without having a technical issue even when we have technicians and support staff and having a mitigation plan but also putting in your pre-briefing that there may be technical issues this is our plan if there are technical issues um, and recognizing that again that goal is taking those learners through that guided experience through a storytelling activity as Aaron mentioned and then and interacting after that. So if your Zoom is down, use your phone. If your phone is down, use uh, you know a chat function or some other technology. But I think uh, not letting the uh, technical issues uh, derail the experience and uh, making sure that you get through some type of experiential opportunity followed by a guided reflection and discussion, and then learn from those technical issues and see what you can do to try to mitigate them in future situations. Thank Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Isabel, is there anything you would like to add on to it? Just a couple of quotes? Yeah, I would just add on a couple of thoughts that are more particular to the telesimulation where um, you have the traditional telesimulation set up with learners, clinic, and everybody there and that facilitator remote. Um, I will say that surprisingly, internet didn't seem to be as much of a problem for us as I thought. The visual also wasn't as much of a problem as I thought. We put a lot of thoughts into the different camera angles. You're kind of able to tell what's going on even with a basic camera. Sound was the big problem. And I talked to Akira about that, same with him in, in Japan. Sound is an issue. And I think for that, I echo what Mark said, just shake off your insecurities about it not working too perfectly. Many times I didn't hear, I didn't see, and I wasn't sure. And still you, you just go with it. And, things will come in up in the debrief. And this is all about who you're teaching. Um, you will still be able to debrief this team, even if you were not able to see everything and hear everything. What helped us as a tip for future to how to mitigate this, I loved having a almost like a confederate in the room that was my ears and my eyes. And we were it was so smooth, just working together for so many years. We They knew exactly what I wasn't gonna be able to see or hear. So I would just get a message, they just, gave a fluid bolus or they said something in Latvian that I didn't understand it was important. So it, it became a very smooth process. So don't be scared of it, just run with it and and smile. <laughs> and a little right. WhatsApp group <laughs> between technician and the yeah. Thank you group. so much. Thank you, Sivan. Uh, that's very useful. Thank you. Um, could I request uh, Sujata? Uh, Sujata Thagarajan is uh, Secretary and also co-founder. Uh, what question do you have, Sujata, panel? So um, my questions are uh, very specific to Phoebe and uh, Elizabeth. Maybe Aaron and uh, Isabel can add on. Um, it's a two-part question, and I'll ask it up front. So we are so used to having face-to-face -face debriefing, and we are just kind of getting to train uh, people here. And uh, now uh, the telestimulation is there and then we do debriefing, uh, you know, remotely. So I just want you to share uh, some insight into what the differences may be between the face-to-face -face one and the remote one. Um, so what challenges did you have? And also maybe some, uh, some tips for us to see how we can bridge that gap. So thank you for asking that question. It's such an important one, and I, I think that Isabel and Mark have um, highlighted some of the some of the differences between sort of the standard versus remote debriefing. Um, but I think the success of both really requires a careful pre-briefing to to set the tone and set the expectations for participants. Um, I, I I think that we're asking them to do things uh, differently, and they're very nervous. I also think it's really important right up front 
um, to call out how awkward um, a, a, a Zoom group activity is um, likely to be where you've got people inadvertently interrupting and talking over each other or doing the opposite and giving each other so much space that you're left with awkward silences. So right up front, I think it's important to tell learners, hey, listen, I, I'm going to use names. I'm going to I'm going to call on you um, to help overcome this awkwardness to make sure that I'm able to um, hear from everybody and really get everybody to, give everybody the opportunity to share their frames. Um, um, I also think explaining the different rules of engagement doing it by Zoom are, are important, um, reminding everybody that it's important for them to keep their video on. Um, I think there's a propensity for people who want to turn their cameras off. Um, and, you know, I would say that, that um, while it can be um, uh, more difficult, I think, to create a truly realistic environment, others in the group have I think highlighted maybe the importance of um, not holding the same expectation as we do when we are in a group all facing one, one another and working on a mannequin. And I've been really pleasantly surprised at how activated participants become when they're engaged, even with the most basic example of telesimulation that I, uh, that I gave. And I have found that either by typing in changes of vital signs at the most basic level or or using the Lairdell or um, Simmon, that that the fact that the participants are being pushed to do something as as the patient is deteriorating is enough for most of them to lose themselves in the activity and to really want to stick around and engage in the debriefing. And I, I, I think that one of the things that I really had to do is to um, sort of forget what I'd been taught about uh, sort of, you know, it, it, it's only be going to be a really valuable activating experience if, if you create this truly realistic, you know, environment. Um, uh, with Zoom, it's very much, uh, it's not everyone facing one another. It's sort of everyone having this, this talk with you. And what happened very naturally, I found, is without my even suggesting it, um, participants just started using the chat and 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 communicating in that way and um, that was just sort of a beautiful on the spot learning experience for me at how well that can work so thank you for asking yeah i completely echo everything phoebe just said that really that pre-brief or even a pre-pre-brief where you're really setting the psychological safety for the learners and that is for in-person and similarly for on telecommunication softwares like Zoom. Um, so really welcoming people, explaining what this is, what this is not, um, explaining that this is not for evaluation purposes, explaining that you're not being recorded, you know, really making folks feel very comfortable in the pre-brief. Um, and then when you get to the debrief, knowing that, um, you know, that hopefully has carried forward in the last 30 minutes and now people feel safe to actively be involved with the debrief where really we know where all the learning happens. So I think, um, you know, just build the people have been describing how to build your zoom presence and how to build how to engage folks and I love how Gita started this entire session with doing icebreakers so uh, we always do that before our simulations so just really making it feel like you're all in the same room on zoom and I think there, there are ways to do that effectively. To, it's really hard to have anything to add to any of that because I think is exactly what I think as well I would just reemphasize I think two elements one is having your video on is critical it is ab people cannot engage if you can't see face it's hard enough to engage when eyes are focused on the camera and not on individuals faces um i get distracted in zoom by looking at how uh, my own mannerisms because typically my picture shows up near the camera so it's a distractor it's a very distracting environment in some ways having people able to see each other is absolutely critical and it's a must um, I would even go so far as to say that scheduling the sims during times of days where people might feel less inhibited to um, be a present uh, on video. I've still had some residents if I have a 7 a.m. sim, they might, you know, have not fully uh, gotten dressed in the morning yet or something. I hadn't even thought of that. So, so timing is a critical thing. And then I would, placing people at ease uh, is also mm -hmm. crucial. And I think the preview is a vital part of that. But if you can just create an atmosphere of conge a congenial, um, warm conversation where people mm -hmm. feel comfortable just speaking and jumping in and really talk about this as a team learning exercise. All the stuff we already know, 
But if you can just emphasize that up front, it goes a lot smoother. And once people get talking, the, 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 it kind of takes care of itself, I find, in many ways. Yeah, I think many things have already been said now. I, I'm sorry, Akita, you were trying to say. Okay, um, but I, I will add this small thing, but just because it's kind of unique when you have learners in a room and you're remote. Um, masks. So I found it a bit challenging not to be able to see my learners' facial expressions. And also, to be honest, I'm faced with different participants, usually different participants that I've never met before with each simulation I'm doing. So I see the same facilitator. But the so what we usually did is either I had... Um, in this case, Italy, I had Anna send me a picture of the participants or they would kind of show their face real quick. <laughs> so I can kind of tell and be, and I really was very careful about knowing the names, knowing who is who. It was challenging with the mask, especially when it's on video to even know who is speaking, who is who, who's interacting. So really in the pre-brief, again, echoing pre-brief, so important, um, really saying, please try to look at each other, say names, which they should do regardless, and it's something they should train. But even more important with a mask, the mask is something I could talk about for an hour. But yeah, <laughs> all right, that's just my two cents for that. Thank you so much. I mean, each one, I mean, it's, it's so important and very useful. Um, really appreciate you coming all the way and sharing your experience with us. I would like to invite Ibar on the stage now. Eivor is our South Zone coordinator. So when all of us have been talking about telesimulation, he went ahead and actually he tried to break all the barriers and went ahead with his dream. He wanted to train everybody in the sepsis and uh, he couldn't do it initially, but now he's managed with everybody's help, all your help. So Eivor, if you could share your experience, please. Thank you. Thanks, Yudan. Can I share my Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Gita, for inviting this panel. And uh, it's been a great learning experience uh, from the sim experts across the world. So as you're saying, but I have to go a long way, but still is the beginning. And uh, as uh, you know, this I've been doing a project with IPSS and as uh, CHOP as a part of my LPC fellowship. Initially, the start of the year, I was thinking of planning to start a, a project named Impact of Simulation on Patient Outcomes. So that's what the real interest on me, how to how it's been translated into patient outcomes in the first hour management of uh, sepsis and septic shock. But as you know, Corona came, uh, COVID-19 came and stopped everything. We had a roadblock and um, uh, it was big till May, we wouldn't know what to do. I was not starting anything. And thanks to Vinay and Gita, they helped me in collaborating with a great team, Elizabeth and uh, Mark, with the ace of Simbox. So I started having experience with the Simbox, as everybody said, yes, it's really had a lot of problem, but we are fascinated by this. And uh, it was a great tool to teach as well as um, improving the team management and critical thinking. But we had some feedbacks from our co-facilitator as well as um, our team participants. So how to make it more interactive, the same, same real patient or in the mannequin videos, as well as when the learner requests or if there is an expected intervention, how can we go about? So that's what the concept of hard keys and hard uh, uh, and we discussed in our group team meetings and uh, and we are hopefully and with the collaboration with our Annenberg communication department so in the University of Pennsylvania, they are uh, trying to make it and uh, it will be a great and exciting opportunity for me to use in this pilot project. So we are looking at the first hour management, mainly on the patient outcomes, looking at the hemodynamic improvement and completion of the time critical interventions, as well as the crisis resource management principle and at the overall outcome. And, uh, and thank you all, I'll stop with this. Probably it's uh, there is running short of time and a special thanks to my team at CMC as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ebor, and congratulations. Uh, Ebor, Liz, and Mark Aubert, the whole team won the award uh, last week, uh, presented this project in the International Telesimulation Conference. So congratulations, the whole team. 
Um, I think we are, it's already 6.20. Uh, we have an important announcement to make uh, as a part of the whole team. We have IPSS and INSPIRE coming soon, October. So I request all of you to register for this. It's going to be a great experience. So what we did today is just a kind of uh, taster. So we're going to learn more in the INSPIRE meeting and the IPSS, so please, please register. Um, I thank all, all the faculty who have come here. You have shown us that there is no barrier is large if the cause is strong and truly appreciate, I know how busy you are. Um, so are we all up to seeing a quick video uh, of the boot camp? Is that all right? Uh, if any of you need to go back to your board round, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to do so and we can take the questions afterwards. So this is a bootcamp video from Vinay. He's brought it from St. Louis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vinay, for getting this video to us. Vinay, what was the, what was that music behind? Uh, that was from Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> Jai Ho. <laughs> That's his favorite Bollywood movie. So we put that in for all of you to welcome you to India. I, um, I may be adding that one to my playlist today. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a beautiful movie, Aaron, you must see that. <laughs> um, Mohit is here. Yeah. Now, I'm Mohit, here. do you have any last questions to ask to our panelists before they can uh, go back to their board round? Then we'll take the questions from audience. Yeah, like it is, obviously we had a lot of negatives from this COVID scenario, but we also found a lot of hidden positives out of it. I would like the I like to ask the panelists, our elite panelists, Vinay and everyone, what are the positives they have found uh, during this era, COVID era for uh, simulation teaching? Well, I think um, one of the benefits is something like this: bring her exploring new things and creating the new normal. As many have said, I see us taking this opportunity, this pivot that people are making and making simulation better. If we keep the objective in mind of the learner, of 
transmitting and discussing and being curious and just using simulation as a tool to stimulate that discussion and debrief, I think will make great progress. And we're going to be able to incorporate much of this as we move forward and make our previous excellent sims even better. So I'm excited about it. And I also think that, that uh, things like this panel, by, like the webinars that will emanate from this, each of these um, each of these individual panelists will be working with you in the future to develop uh, webinars that can be spread across India and where people will have much opportunity to ask the experts and the people who are at the forefront uh, their specific questions. Thank you, Vinay. Um, anyway, it's a great question, uh, Mohit. Um, I echo Vinay's thought. Any of you would like to add on to it, Aaron? Yeah, I'll just, I'll add on. I think, uh, I think Vinay's really hit the nail on the head. And I think that to me, this has been an opportunity to explode previous myths that we've told ourselves about what it takes to run a meaningful, educationally advantageous simulation to our learners. I think we're learning from this that um, the uh, opportunities for simulation are not tied to possessing large budgets and things of that nature as much as we may have thought in time past. We're learning, I think, that fidelity is in the eye of the beholder and something that is of high fidelity for physical procedure skills. It's not the same kind of fidelity when you're trying to teach a complex cognitive task or associate abstract uh, physiologic knowledge like those curves I showed with an actual patient. A lot of that stuff happens in the mind. And so um, what I think see coming out of this is I don't see distance or telesimulation going anywhere at all. I see it being a very important foundation. And the real questions are gonna be what's best done in distance sim and what's best done uh, in in-person sim, even when the pandemic hopefully is a memory uh, because I'm starting to think that there are learning objectives that are better in the virtual environment. And there are some that are better in the uh, in-person environment. I think we have our work cut out for us to figure out what's what and how we make those decisions though. And so I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the research base this is gonna generate as we really sort, seek to really sort these issues out. I think you're muted, Gita. You. Um, I, I love, if I can make a comment. So I, I think, um, you know, you. we had a meeting, Gita, on, um, on uh, nomenclature and what we should call uh, distance simulation. And I think I, I just had a reflection that perhaps we need to just call this all simulation. And I think that we can't need nomenclature, um, you know, to help ourselves understand. But I think for the end user, um, one of the things that's striking to me is that breaking down the barriers and walls and sort of this concept of democratizing simulation to make sure that anyone anywhere has the ability to engage engage in experiential learning with reflective discussion. And I, I really would encourage, I saw some comments in the chat box and one was about the cost. I think one of the things that um, certainly in the first you know, few years of my 12 years in simulation was we needed money, we needed money, we needed money, we need to buy stuff. And I think that this shows us that really you can have a simulation that costs a hundred million dollars, but you could probably also have a simulation that just costs you your time. And I think that's because of the wonderful collaboration that we can uh, borrow from each other's work and interact and collaborate. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get away from having any terms for distance simulation, but I'm not sure if we have um, the need for our end users to to break it down as much as we're going to have you show up and interact with faculty or facilitators probably um, that can uh, help you to gain knowledge and skills and that our focus should be on creating those opportunities and creating those interactions. Um, and, and yes, we want them to be high quality. Yes, we want them to show translation to patient outcomes as Ibor mentioned, but I think that we do all recognize that if simulation based methods with a pre-brief, a simulation and a debrief are conducted in a way that is 
uh, really in line with best practices, wherever the different people are, there should be a positive learning outcome. And hopefully Ebor will demonstrate that there's a positive clinical outcome as well. But uh, the, the other comment that came up was checklists. And I'll just put a plug in from some of our learnings that, that if you are using simulation checklists from either clinical or um, other simulation activities, just making sure to adapt those checklists. So things that might have been stated before, such as the learner places a bag valve mask uh, and administers oxygen may now be changed to things like verbalizes the placement of a bag valve mask and verbalizes the uh, volume and rate of administration. Um, but I think that checklists are helpful, largely in my experience as a tool to support me in my debriefing and provide some feedback. Um, so thank you again so much for this opportunity and, and really, um, you know, I think we are democratizing simulation and I think that your work with PD stars and the number of learners just blows my mind. Uh, hopefully we can get that to a, a billion learners someday across the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I know some of the faculty would like to uh, say uh, some uh, advice to us. So before that, on behalf of the DISTAS, I request all of you who are participating here and uh, watching there to volunteer with the step one. They are doing a great, great work volunteering for the COVID. So I plead all of you uh, to come and volunteer for project step one, please. Thank you. Um, any other questions on the, sorry, Vinay, would you like to say something? <laughs> no, I'm sorry, questions? I just have to, I have to leave. I just wanted to say All right. okay. namaste. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Thank you Thank all you. for coming. I hope it's just the beginning. So we would like to do more of these webinars to train our team. I really appreciate you taking your time and thank you so much Project Step 1 for organizing this and thank all our uh, executive team pedistars being here with us and showing the, our strength. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bye -bye. This has been a wonderful session. This has been a wonderful session. And uh, uh, dear audience, stay tuned for tomorrow's session on Stay Away from Predators. This is all about child sexual abuse. And we have a great uh, speaker coming tomorrow as well at 5 p.m. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, uh, doctors and Pedista group for joining us today and doing this wonderful session for us. I thank you. Thank you, Shruti. And, and, uh, and if I can take a minute of yours. So we have something that we do with all the doctors. We say we shall overcome COVID-19 soon together. So can we do that again here, please? So on the count of three, yes. I want you all to, if I request you all to unmute <laughs> and on the count of three, let's say we shall overcome COVID-19 soon, right? Right, so three, two, one, go. We, we shall overcome COVID-19 soon. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.